Good evening. Uh, welcome to uh, our webinar or session with BrewDog um, with David McDowell. Um, many of you should have received uh, a few cans of BrewDog, so please do open one, pour it out, relax and enjoy. I've gone for a nanny steak to uh, kick off. Um, if you haven't received your cans of BrewDog, then I expect they'll be in transit and you can enjoy them at your leisure uh, in due course. Um, I would have asked you to show your faces because it's quite lonely uh, here, but we can't see you on GoToWebinar, so I trust you're there and enjoying yourselves. Um, as I said, I'm, um, my name's Ed Savory. I'm a partner at Burkitt's in our corporate team, and I head up our food and drink sector team. Um, I just thought before I introduce um, David, I'd just reflect a little bit on, on where we're at. You know, it's been 12 months since lockdown 1.0, been an extraordinary time. Um, if there was one word I think that would sum up um, the essential ingredient to getting through that, I'd say it's grit. I've been astonished, um, although perhaps not surprised, by the sheer grit of my colleagues at Burkitt's here, of our clients and our friends of the firm who have dug deep to make the best of this situation. Um, it's great to see, um, to have so many of our clients uh, here with us this evening, and it's been amazing to watch so many of them pivot and reshape themselves and their businesses almost overnight as their customer markets have driven up as well, uh, have dried up. Um, my one ask this evening is probably to reflect hard. If you're one of those lucky businesses which has been able to continue to thrive, then remember that you've probably been lucky and be prepared to support others who haven't been so fortunate. I suspect that as we come out of this current lockdown 3.0, we've got a bit of a responsibility, a responsibility to do all of our, do our bit to help the full guys who have been uh, simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. I remember being taught that in life, you need to be lucky. And as a great Gary, uh, golfer, Gary Player said, it's funny, the more I practice, the luckier I get. But how do you ensure that you are lucky? How do you empower your workforce to develop that grit and what do you need to do so you adapt uh, and react faster than your competitors? Well, that is simple. You behave like a shark on steroids. Yep, you behave like a shark on steroids, or at least that is what BrewDog do. Um, which brings me on to David. Good evening. David is the president and COO of BrewDog. So good evening, David. Hi, Ed. Thanks. Thanks for that intro and thanks to, to everyone at Burkitts for having me tonight. No problem. I mean, quite frankly, BrewDog, in my view, is one of the most remarkable businesses in the UK and in probably, in fact, the world right now. Um, I happen to love your beer, um, but I admire the company's, you know, you've got to admire the, the company's stratospheric growth, but not, I think, just because the growth itself, but with the way in which you've done that. You're a disruptor, renegade, cheeky to the extreme. Um, and before I hand over to David, I'm just going to tell you how this is going to play out. We're going to hear from David for about 20, 25 minutes to tell us about the BrewDog journey. Um, I've heard already much of what he's going to cover, and I can promise you, you're in for a real treat tonight. So sit back and relax. I'm then going to go and uh, ask David a few questions. And then following that, we're going to open up the Q&A um, to, to you, the audience, um, for around 20 minutes. But we've got permission to drift over time if we like. Thank you to many of you who've already submitted your questions, but feel free to submit further questions using the Q&A as we go. Um, I did ask David before if there's anything we should not ask him, and he made it very clear to me that he is happy to answer any questions. So please, you know, I dare you to be cheeky, and I dare you to push the boundaries and have some fun. But that's enough of me for the moment. David, over to you if that's okay. Thanks, Ed. Thanks for that introduction. I'm going to try and just show some visuals to you all. Hopefully everyone can everyone can see that. Um, and um, and yeah, thank you, thank you so much for that for that introduction. And um, my um, uh, uh, my my job tonight is to tell you guys a little bit about the story of this remarkable um, business, the things that we have uh, done that have been the the the, the kind of clear milestones along the way. The things that we've got right and wrong, um, and hopefully some of that is relatable to to you all as you as you go about your your own business journey. Um, I'm David. I'm the president and chief operating officer at, at Brewdog, and um, uh, and we are uh, a business that was founded in 2007 by two men and a dog, with a simple mission, a simple mission to make other people as passionate about great beer as we are. And 13 years on. 
the mission remains exactly the same. The scale of the business, um, the scale of the opportunity, the geography is wildly different than we could ever have imagined. Um, however, that overarching sense of purpose is exactly the same as it was when the first ever batch of our beer was brewed um, in a garage in the northeast of Scotland in 2007. So from, um, from 2007 and from two men and a dog, uh, the BrewDog team have built a considerable business now. We export beer to 65 countries around the world. We have four large scale world-class craft breweries around the globe. We have 105 of our own bars delivering phenomenal beer experiences day in, day out in 15 different countries. And, and recently we were ranked higher than Carlsberg in a brand finance report of the most valuable beer brands on the planet. So for a business that started out with a real sense of purpose to put the flavor and the taste and the artisan craftsmanship back into people's beer glasses um, and to rally against a cat the, uh, some macro beer businesses that had built a category that had become commoditized um, then to find ourselves, you know, a decade later, more valuable than one of those large scale competitors is is both exciting and surreal at the same at the same time. So on the list of the most valuable beer brands on the planet, we are the only craft beer brand on that list. We are the only independently owned brand on that list and the only brand from the UK. And right at the start, as I said, this, this business was founded with a singular focus mission to make other people as passionate about great beer as we are. And at the heart of that is a focus on an obsessive focus on the quality of the liquid, a focus on having positive impact, a focus on building a community of people who believe what we believe, and crucially, a focus on building a product that is for everyone. This was never about building a niche brand. This was about taking the positive attributes of small, local artisan craft businesses and trying to find a way to deliver that on a global scale. Um, so um, we paused for, for too long on this slide, but um, I, will, I, will, I will talk about why this very simple image is an, is, is an important story in the in the in the way that we have built the business of BrewDog. So many years ago, I, I saw a fantastic documentary about Lego. And in that documentary, it gave you a really behind the scenes look of how that business operated. Um, and actually the really interesting and secretive way that they take very great care over how they build the products. And one of the things that you got to see was behind the scenes in their offices and HQ. And I noticed while watching that documentary that on every desk, um, on every boardroom table or every meeting room table, there were little bowls of colorful bricks, little bowls of yellow, yellow and red and blue Lego bricks. And at any point when people were on calls, were dealing with customers or were in meetings with their colleagues, everyone was fidgeting with these little bricks. And for me, it was really powerful because it reminded me that that business was founded on a very simple premise and that everyone in the business at every level understood that without these little magical bits of plastic, the whole thing wouldn't exist and their roles wouldn't exist. And the equivalent of that in BrewDog is that we live or die every day by the quality of what's in every bottle, every can, every keg, every glass. Um, and that obsessive focus on product quality and bringing everything back to a singular vision, mission and purpose has been at the heart of everything that we've, we've done as we've built this thing. I want to talk a little bit about the community element of what we do. And back in 2009, we had some brilliant opportunities to grow this business quite considerably. We had a burgeoning grocery and supermarket business. And we also had some opportunities to open the first brew dog bars um, um, around the country and, and some internationally as well. And we needed some funding. Uh, and at that time, post-banking crisis, then unfortunately, 
most of the institutional lenders were not particularly keen to give some cash to a couple of guys from the northeast of Scotland making beer that everybody thought was was tasting far too bitter. Um, so we were very early adopters of crowdfunding. Um, and it became it came straight out of necessity. And I think sometimes great innovation does come out of necessity. And at that point in time, I think it was the sixth uh, legal firm that we to spoke to that told us there was a way to do this. The first five told us that there was just no way to build a framework to create our own crowdfunding platform at that point in time. We um, we discovered that it was probably a £150,000 project to build this platform, um, which is about 10000 more than we had in the bank at that point in time. So we put everything on, our, on red for this opportunity. And via the first round of equity for punks, we raised just over a million pounds worth of capital. Now, um, we have raised over 90 million pounds of capital from 185,000 investors around the world who all own a small part of our business. And we found out something very, very interesting and actually game changing for our business along the way. We found out that it wasn't a fundraising exercise at all. It was much, much more than that. It was a community building exercise. So now we have this incredible army of almost 200,000 investors around the globe who believe what we believe, who fight for the same things that we do, who are also sometimes our most ardent fans and harshest critics. They're like a massive army of mystery guests all over the world. Um, and having that community over the last decade has been our secret weapon as we have taken the fight to Big Beer. To really understand the nuts and bolts of how the business behaves, I thought that honing in on the last 12 months might be quite useful for that purpose. And I really think that great teams are forged in the fire of adversity. That we really find out the best about our teams and our people when we face into obstacles. And um, you know, the seafaring analogy would be that we find out who our best people are when the seas are stormy, not when the seas are calm. Um, and that's definitely been the case for Brewdog over the last 12 months. Around about um, this time last year, then overnight, it looked as though we were losing 70% of our revenue. We did not know if the business would survive the crisis. And um, our bars were closing around the world. We'd lost all of our on-trade volume. International export orders were tanking and we faced into the worst crisis that we could ever have imagined. I remember actually around about this time last year, a very important part of that, which was standing in front of 250 team members in a warehouse in the Northeast of Scotland and explaining to them that we didn't know if the business would survive. And subsequently at that point, we didn't know if we'd be able to protect their livelihoods. Um, and myself and James, who's one of the founders of the business is in the picture there, um, we're standing on a couple of pallets talking to our team and we both just completely broke down in tears because we couldn't believe that we found ourselves over, almost overnight saying this to our teams. And a very, very interesting thing happened. A really life affirming thing happened actually. At the end of that, after being told that the business might not survive and they may find themselves jobless, all of our team applauded us. And it gave me a sense of purpose to go away and find a way for this business not just to survive but to prosper through the crisis the business plan went in the bin and the business plan very quickly became two things first of all to ensure that the business survived and secondly to protect the livelihood of as many of our team members as we possibly could and at the same time we realized that we had um, first of all an opportunity to do some good but second of all we had to find a way to make sure that our brand was front and center with as many people and, and consumers as possible. Nobody wanted to hear marketing from a beer brand in the depths of the, the global pandemic. So we put all of our time and energy into how we can have positive impact. And a couple of great examples of that is that we, you know, we own a distillery um, up in Aberdeenshire and we closed that down and repurposed it to make hand sanitizer. I remember the day that we sat with our lead distiller and Googled the WHO hand sanitizer recipe, and that's how the whole thing started. 
Um, and we ended up running for almost six months, um, a 24 seven lo-fi makeshift hand sanitizer production line that made and completely donated half a million bottles of sanitizer to the NHS, to key workers um, and to care homes around the country. Um, and this is a list of some of the things that some of the things that we that we did, um, including um, all of our directors. Um, uh, we 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 for for went our salary for the year. Um, we um, we have a brewery in the in the US and in Ohio. They were struggling with supplies of bottled water, so we repurposed the brewery for two months to make canned water to make sure that the supermarkets over there had supply of packaged water, um, and. Back in December, uh, we offered um, free use of all of our bars to be used as vaccination centers. And that ended up turning into a situation where we now supply free canned water to um, about 150 vaccination centers around the, around the UK. At the depth of the crisis, then there were some real opportunities for us to um, to speak about things that we believe in. And we've always been a brand that is prepared to put our head above the parapet um, and talk about social issues that we really have a point of view on. And um, everyone will remember the, the saga with Dominic Cummings um, back in, in, I think, May of last year. Um, and in the morning that that was really kicking off and there was a civil service person who tweeted um, a very famous tweet that quickly got deleted, um, then we jumped on Twitter and said, whoever that civil servant was gets free chicken wings and free beer and brew dog bars for the rest of their life. Um, and the tweet went viral. And we kind of realized that we might be onto something. So the next thing that we did is said that we were going to produce a commemorative beer um, to comment on what had been going on in the news. Um, and we asked our community and our social community to help us choose the name for that beer. Um, and gave them four options. And the winner was Barnard Castle Eye Test. This became a mainstream news cycle piece of activity, all from a opportunistic tweet. And then the next day, so within 48 hours, we put that beer on pre-sale on our, on our online shop, on our website. And a remarkable thing happened. Within an hour, we were selling 100 cases of that beer a minute online. Um, we hadn't made a drop of it yet. Um, and this turned out to be the most popular and the most successful beer that we sold in 2020 online. So there was no marketing spend. There was no advertising spend. There was no strategic brand approach. There was an opportunistic view of something that was happening in the news cycle and the ability of our awesome team to turn that into a commercial opportunity and to do it in a fun and vibrant and irreverent way. And this is another good example of that. This happened to us during COVID as well. And we often talk about the fact that when others zig, we always try and zag. And this example speaks to that in spades, I think. So we were, like many businesses and like many brands, um, Aldi decided to produce a, a copy of one of our products. So our flagship beer is Punk IPA. And on the right-hand side of the screen there, you can see Anti-Establishment IPA, which was the, the Aldi version of our beer and it was so so close in every way to the point where they'd kind of like effectively cut and paste the beer descriptor at the back of the can so our first reaction to that was that we picked up the phone to our legal team like any business would um, and then we very realized that that was a conventional approach um, and we believe that building a business with grand and audacious plans um, we need to take an unconventional approach to turning adversity into opportunity. So as opposed to getting legal, we decided to design a, um, a copy of the copy and we produced ALD IPA. Um, and, uh, and within probably six hours, we had this out on our website and we'd, and we'd spoken about it in social. And Aldi really got into the spirit of this thing. And the two brands kind of argued and debated back and forth in the public domain about, uh, about what we should do. Um, and within a month, this had also turned into a great commercial opportunity. We've now sold over half a million cans of Ald IPA in the UK, and we just launched that beer 
in the Aldi Germany stores last week as well. So a really good example of how an unconventional approach to a potentially big issue turned into a great piece of commercial activity. At the heart of everything that we do is a fundamental belief that business should be a force for good. And we believe that in the, in the months and years to come, how consumers choose to spend their money and which businesses they choose to support will be as powerful as how they choose to vote, especially as that relates to the existential climate crisis that we all face. So this is our, uh, this is our um, uh, advertising campaign from summer last year, um, uh, focused on trying to find a way to use our platform to get that message across. Um, and in August last year, we became the first, the world's first carbon negative beer business. At the heart of everything we do is a firm belief in sustainability. And we believe that in five years time, the most sustainable beer business on the planet and the most valuable and successful beer business on the planet will be the same thing. Um, and we think that we have a shot of positioning ourselves to be that business. So via an aggressive program of carbon reduction and the support of a number of really high quality carbon offsetting programs um, in forestation um, and in peatland restoration, um, we're now able to say that every part of our business is carbon negative. But via that program, we discovered that it was very difficult to find a suite of carbon offsetting projects that we really believed in and were at the standard that we wanted them to be to make sure that we were staying really true to that firm purpose on sustainability. So at the tail end of last year, we bought nine and a half thousand acres of land just next to Aviemore in the Scottish Highlands. And now for every multi-pack, four pack or 12 pack of Brewdog beer that is sold, we plant a tree in the Brewdog Forest. And over the next 18 months, we will plant just over 2 million trees in that 9,500 acres. So there's been a lot of good things that the brand has done over the last 12 months. And that has had a really positive impact on our brand. So it has made, at the time, we were really reacting to opportunity and we felt like we were fighting for our lives at times. But our brand approach, our sustainability approach, things like our sanitizer and COVID-19 responses and irreverent fun pieces of activity like Barnard Castle eye test have all built significant equity in our brand. And remarkably, in a recent YouGov survey, some survey, members of the public said they were four times more likely to buy a brew dog than to pick up a Heineken. So grand audacious, ambitious plans. And we've always taken a view that we can only deliver on those with an exceptional team, really galvanized and really focused on our mission and fundamentally who believe the same things that we do. And we have done that in a way, we now have 2000 members of the, in the team and we've done that in a way that we've tried to avoid unnecessary hierarchy. We've tried to keep our structures flat and lean. We've tried to give our top performers breadth as opposed to depth. And we've tried to avoid building a suite of corporate programs and activity and guidelines. And this, these five points are the Brewdog dogmas. And this is the framework by which we've built this business and that we guide our teams to lead in a truly Brewdog way. And I'll pick a few of these just to discuss in a little bit more detail, but my favorite one is count time and dog years. Now our firm belief is that if a conventional business would take seven months to deliver on a project or a product or a piece of activity, then the Brewdog team should do that in one month. Um, and counting time in dog years is absolutely the heart of everything that we do when we're managing our teams and projects. And it keeps the pace in the business that we had back in day one. And it helps us fight for the small things just as hard as we did when it was the early days and we were fighting to pay the wages at the end of the at the end of the month. Um, so counting time in dog years is absolutely at the heart of everything that we do. And the first two are really important as well, because I think often when people think of Brewdog, 
they think about you know a load of guys with beards and tattoos thinking of wacky beer names and and that's the spirit of what we do and there's a little bit of that incidentally um, but underneath the spirit of that is a very disciplined and rigorous organization we've been in the fast track 100 sunday times fast track 100 a record nine years in a row we've been profitable since year one um, and there's a really disciplined approach to how we run this thing and we are a meritocracy the people who perform well and, 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 and build great careers in BrewDog have earned that place on the team. We, you know, we refer to it quite openly sometimes as like earning your, earning your place on a pro sports team. So the team are galvanized behind a single purpose. Um, they work together, they're connected so closely, but they still have to really perform at a level to earn their space on that team. And we really truly own our numbers because we fight for every penny. And one of the reasons that we do that is because a lot of our capital, certainly for the first seven or eight years or so, came from our crowdfunding escapades. So when you have raised money from 180,000 um, hairdressers, waiters, taxi drivers, nurses who have all had, um, invested on average around about 350 pounds of their hard earned cash in your business then we feel that we've got a real responsibility to put that work that money to work in a way that is very well thought through very disciplined and right in line with why that people believed in us in the first place so the brew dog dogmas are our framework for building this business in a truly brew dog way and just lastly, before we move on to questions, I thought I would I would show you guys a slide, um, a page from our company induction book. And we truly, truly do believe that we are an anomaly, um, a glitch in the matrix, and we're very, very proud of that. And a lot of what we do is trying to make sure that we stay that way. We didn't get to where we are now by being normal. We didn't get here by playing it safe or by conforming. And we got here by being fast, tenacious, passionate, wearing our hearts on our sleeves and putting everything on the line for what we believe in. So we truly, truly believe we're in the driving seat of the beer industry. We truly believe that we're only just getting started. We are super transparent about the things that we've got right and wrong along the way, but mostly we're super proud of the incredible team of 2000 people who have helped us build this remarkable British success story in a very, very unconventional way. Thank you very much. David, thank you. Um, it's almost exhausting listening to, but enthralling at the same time. Um, I've just finished off my um, stop for a sip of beer now. nanny state beer and just tucked into a can of uh, Brewdog Lost. Uh, and I think that's the first thing to remember in your business, that your, your product is fantastic and that seems to be always at the core of what you're doing i mean i know you can touch that but that is right isn't it it's right and it comes from a very selfish place ed so right back in the day we made beers that we couldn't find elsewhere so we were inspired by some of the great american craft breweries like sierra nevada and stone and um, and you know, 13 years ago, you could not get that beer in the uh, in the UK. So that's where it all started. And 13 years on, producing a million hectolitres of beer a year, I think we're still making beers for us. Um, and and I think that perversely, that selfishness is at the heart of why there's such a rigorous focus on quality across every aspect of the process. Yeah, you can, and you feel that you feel that with the business. One of the, I've got various questions before I'm going to open up to our audience that I just want to touch on. Sure. But one thing that astounds me is the speed at which you can seize an opportunity and go for it full tilt, have fun, and seem to find opportunities that then have a really positive commercial angle for the business as well, like you touched on with the Barnard Castle sort of situation. How does your, how do you do that? Well, First of all, there's two points to it, right? So first of all, it's it's not always fun. So um, quite often I'll tell the team that it's type two fun, right? So the end result is quite good, but how we get there is not fun. <laughs> um, um, and you know, Barna Castle went to went from a tweet on my iPhone to 
um, half a million, an order for half a million cans from Aldi in 72 hours. Um, and, and, you know, we're proud of that space and we're proud of that kind of counting time in dog years. Um, but it's not always fun. Um, and we face into that, actually. We, I think people who are really successful in this business face into the type two fun and perversely quite enjoy it. Um, secondly, one of the ways that we do it is by having um, lean anti-hierarchical structures. Um, um, there is no, there's no unnecessary hierarchy. Um, and the, the, you know, one of the brew dog dogmas is be where the action is. Project sponsors and people who are leading a project are in the heart of the decision making process every way through the journey. And um, so, if in our team there is a project meeting for something that we're working on and the key decision maker is not at that meeting, then we will just not let that meeting go ahead because all that's going to happen is that eight people are going to talk for half an hour about things that they can't decide. Um, so, we're very, very passionate about maintaining a nimble fleet of foot approach and, and giving great people. A great package, great incentive, great bread, so they can really stick their nose into other people's business, which is something we're very passionate about, but not allowing them to build unnecessary empire underneath them. Because I don't want my great leaders to spend their time managing, um, you know, twelve sub department managers, and every one of those takes ten percent of their time. I want them to spend their time driving our agenda and being as close to the customer as possible. Amazing. It seems to work. Um, I wanted to touch on, we've heard some of the great things that have happened and obviously the business is in fantastic shape and has really faced up the last 12 months. Um, we go back a couple of years, um, your, uh, James, the um, one of the founders, was quite open about some of the mistakes he made. And one of them was um, where you decided to, as I would put it, sort of helicopter in some sophisticated management, uh, senior management people that didn't quite work. Could you just talk a little bit about that and sort of what what, what drove you to do it, what had happened, and then how you then dealt with it, which I think is equally as interesting. Before I do that, I think sometimes when you do these presentations, it's so obvious, it's so easy for it to come across as kind of 10, 20 slides of how, listen, here's how brilliant we are. And my God, we get stuff wrong all the time. And um, and actually on the COVID response page where there's so many interesting stories to talk about, there is a book at some point in all the ideas that we had during COVID that we decided not to do. And thank God we didn't. And so I think facing into those mistakes is really important as part of the culture. And uh, you know James's article, which was my 10 biggest mistakes as BrewDog's founder, um, is right at the heart of that. That particular one um, was uh, probably a journey that a lot of fast growth businesses go on, where we got to a point where I think we're probably 150, 200 million turnover. Um, we were growing at pace. Um, our compound annual growth rate for the past six or seven years has been 70 to 75 percent. It's kind of hang on to your hats time. And a lot of the advice that we were getting was we need to professionalize the management team. Um, so we spent a heck of a lot of money um, with some real top level recruitment agents. Um, and we went and found ourselves at what on paper looked like a grade A team of blue chip corporate superstars from a load of great listed businesses and, and, and businesses that we admired. And every single, first and foremost, actually, every single one of these individuals was a super talented, intelligent person with loads to add. Not a single one of them, and I think there was maybe seven or eight people that joined the exec team. Not a single one of them works for us anymore. And that is nothing to do with the ability of that person, but it's got a lot to do with where we were at in our journey at that point in time. So suddenly parachuting in eight strong-willed, strong-minded, capable leaders to a team that had a very, very well embedded culture. And it just threw a bomb right in the middle of it. Um, and actually we slowed down. We lost a lot of our edge. We lost a lot of that pace and it wasn't the right thing to do. Now, subsequently some great people who, you know, are, are uh, we hired a great new CFO uh, last year who came from a, a really kind of blue chip background and he's added tons of value. Um, but one of the things that we did to avoid us making that mistake of doing all of that at once 
um, again, was that we built something called the Brewdog Salary Cap, where effectively we will never hire someone who earns any more than seven times on a starting salary, any more than seven times the lowest paid member of our team. And that goes up one year at a time to 13 times, and that's the max. And what it does is that it means that we have a real responsibility, or I have a real responsibility to think two, three years ahead, look at the team and succession plan for who the exec team is going to be in two, three, four, five years time. And it's helped us build some great internal success stories. So we wasted a heck of a lot of money in recruitment agents. Um, uh, we, we, you know, unfortunately upset a little bit of the life cycle of the careers of some very smart and talented people, but they've all moved on to great, great things and we've learned a lot from it. Yeah, good story. I think it's a, I think it's a great sign of a strong business that can recognise when it hasn't necessarily got the right people in the right place and is prepared to take tough decisions and replace them. And certainly, you know, we, you know, Burkitt's we have a huge um, desire to protect and enhance our culture. And whilst we continue to grow people internally, we do bring people in externally and they have to be, you know, they have to get on, you know, get on script with us. So it makes sense. Um, sort of taking that point forward, and again, it's something I'm particularly interested with, you know, I happen to be based in uh, in Norwich and Norfolk and sometimes a perception you can't grow great businesses from the, you know, the strange corners of the uh, country. And I mean, no disrespect to Aberdeenshire, no disrespect to uh, Fraserburgh, where I've been actually cycling. Um, it's a sort of a bit of a Chorleman capital. Um, it isn't the obvious place where you would expect to start a super business like Brewdog. But you did it, and um, I, I guess I'd just like to explore how that's evolved because you're still very much based in Aberdeenshire, but with a kind of with a you know with a twist and some and additions to sort of be able to thrive and continue to grow. Yeah, we're in we're in Ellen, which is um, uh, 25 miles past Aberdeenshire in the northeast of Scotland, small town. Um, there aren't that many billion pound valuation businesses in Ellen. Um, and um, uh, we might be the only one. And um, and there's a, there's a couple of interesting things in it. In that, uh, actually, pre-pandemic, we were really really good as a team at working remotely and across a broad ge geography um, uh, and working virtually. So this, you know, we, the team really breezed into this whole Zoom Teams culture because it was part of what we did. And that's just because we had to. Our view is that. You know, to deliver exceptional performance, we need the top 1% of people in each of their areas. Um, and some of those people might not want to move to the northeast of Scotland. So our marketing and digital team is based out of uh, an office in East London. Um, it's a bit of a cliche in itself, isn't it? Um, uh, we have a, a brewery and um, uh, uh, a brewery, tap room, beer hotel, and a massive offices in Ohio in the Midwest um, in the US, where our US team is based. Um, our, a lot of our European team is based out of our brewery in Germany, in Berlin, um, and we have um, a team in brewery in, in, in Australia as well. So the, the, team have, the team have just been excellent all, um, at working in that remote environment. It's, actually, there's some real pluses to it, and that is, you know, we're, we're very anti-meeting in Brewdog. Um, my own diary is chunked into 20-minute slots, so there's nothing in a day that lasts any longer than 20 minutes. And... As a result of that, we get to the point really quickly, and that's really helped by these virtual sessions because there's there's no kind of messing around. We get straight straight to business, um, so that's really helped, um, and um, and it's forced us to work as a really global, really virtual team, and it's forced us to think differently about how our teams can can interact. So, Ellen in the northeast of Scotland is still home. It's still where a big chunk of our team are. Um, uh, but I feel just as connected to the teams in um, Germany or the US or Australia or London as I do to the guys that are, you know, just down the road. Yeah, it's impressive. But I love the fact the core of the business is still, you know, we you know pretty much where it started off. Um, yeah, that's the centre of gravity for sure. Yeah, uh, one of the, an, another interesting feature of Breeder, which I think is fascinating, especially as a lawyer, is the fact that we often advise clients that you've got to protect your intellectual property, you've got to guard it with your life. <laughs> Brewdog doesn't do that uh, with your, uh, with, you know, with your recipes. Um, in fact, <laughs> you tell everyone exactly what they are every year. Can yeah. you just talk, sort of expand on that a little bit? Because I find that fascinating. So for us, it's the most natural thing ever, right? So we are, 
not just trying to build a beer brand. We're trying to build a insurgent movement and we're trying to build a revolution against a category that has been dominated by the big players who focus 99% on advertising and marketing budget and 1% on beer quality. We wanted to flip that completely on its head. Um, hence why all of our marketing approach has been so very, very lo-fi and guerrilla and, um, and, and doesn't always have a load of uh, advertising bucks behind it. Um, um, so what we're really trying to do is grow a category and to hopefully in a as humble a way as possible, educate consumers about what great beer should really taste like. This is a mad mix of science and art. This is not a commodity. Um, so every year we produce a book called DIY Dog. Um, kind of it's our annual kind of Guinness Book of Records that comes out at the end of every year. And it has the full detailed recipe and spec to how we made every single beer that we made that year. Um, and we publish it online as a PDF for free for anyone to read and download. Um, and we do that, you know, so it, it it is unconventional and everyone at the time is very open source, right? So everyone thought that it was a little bit crazy because effectively, as you quite rightly point out, Ed, it's kind of like the key, you're giving away the keys to the kingdom a little bit. Um, but I think it speaks to two things. I think it speaks to, first of all, our belief that growing the category is more important than protecting something that is maybe not really ours in the first place because what we are doing is evolving great beer recipes from the past like everybody else does. And secondly, I think it speaks to our belief that it's far more important to grow a category and to grow a movement than it is to grow a business or a brand. Fascinating. That is uh, it's interesting. You touched on something. I am about to turn to the audience. So uh, this is probably, uh, this, this is probably my last question. Yeah. Your relationship with the big players um, is quite interesting. And I think there's a there's a famous story of a couple of years ago where Diageo effectively bribed some judges to make sure you didn't win a competition, which is extraordinary on several levels. But I think what's extraordinary is, of course, the, the, the own goal they score by giving you the perfect opportunity to do some fabulous PR on the back of it. When we spoke last week, I'd just like to, I think it's quite interesting, your relationship with other um, other breweries is, is very mixed. And I just like, I think the audience might be quite interested to understand how you interact with, you know, the small craft breweries to the, you know, the global mega players and, and how you see that. Well, listen, we we were, we were one of those small craft breweries and, and a number of other larger breweries at that time were phenomenal to us and, and helping us learn and grow as we built this thing. And we're you know, forever grateful to some of those some of those mentors and breweries. And we tried to do a little bit of the same. Um, so 35 percent of the beers that are on tap in our own locations are beers just from other breweries that are local or international that we love. Um, we, you know, it's often that people say it's a little bit like Pepsi selling Coke. You know, it's like we're we're kind of selling our competitors' products, but we're selling independent craft beer brands that we really believe in and love, and we give them a platform and we buy their beer. We actually just launched today a product which is our first, um, uh, which is our new beer subscription service, a monthly beer box called Brewdog and Friends, and half of the beers in that box every month is beers just from breweries in the uh, around the world that we really love. So. We believe that growing the category is important and we believe that supporting other businesses in beer that believe what we believe is important. Um, our relationship with the with the kind of larger macro breweries is, um, is, is kind of slightly different. We, we view that our biggest competitors are still two to two and a half thousand site times larger than we are. Um, and therefore, we still in that respect view ourselves as firstly, a very small business. And secondly, as only just getting started. The Diageo story is a great example of that, where um, they really played into our hands in terms of giving us a platform to talk about how it was important to support businesses who had a sense of purpose. Um, actually, funnily enough, this year, we overtook Diageo on the, on the league table of the largest breweries in, in the UK off premise. So we now sell more beer into supermarkets than Diageo do. And at that point, we kind of reflected for a second on that moment <laughs> where we had a bit of a battle with them and it was, and it was bizarre. And this, the, the last bit for me on that is that I think that um, 
teams galvanize sometimes behind a common enemy um, and our common enemy is big beer and bad beer um, um, uh, we think that craft and independent beer and great beer can be done at scale um, but we think to do that you have to think very differently um, and build an unconventional business and not follow the well-trodden path that some of our larger competitors have thank you very much okay well let I think the audience have heard enough of my questions. We've got some um, coming in. I'm sorry, one person did ask which, in which order we should drink the beers. I've only just picked the question up. Um, I, I, I don't think it matters. They're all great in my view, but um, forgive me if I'm wrong there. Um, we talked, there's a question about microbreweries we've covered. Um, one, okay. Oh, this is a good question. Let's get to this. When are you Here. opening in Chelms? When are you opening in Chelmsford? Well, actually, we have we we have been looking at a location in Chelmsford for a wee while. I think um, so that it's not out with the realms of possibility. Actually, so um, one of the things that we didn't talk about in the in the presentation is that despite the challenges of pubs and retail over the last year, we have a pipeline of forty two brand new Brewdog bars that are in various stages of development. Chelmsford's not quite on the list yet. Um, but a number of UK locations and all the way to a rooftop bar in Las Vegas, actually, which we're very excited about. Um, and so there's plenty more Brewdog locations on the way and there's a reasonable chance that Chelsea might pop up actually. Okay, well, that's gonna satisfy one of our one, one audience. Um, question here there are some really uh, there's some really excellent marketing ideas that have gone viral due to controversial surprising spin but presumably you must consider the risk of moving away from your customers views for example the independence debate in scotland or brexit are probably too diverse to consider a brand spin or comment yeah i mean i, I think that we have we have commented on some pretty divisive things um, um, so, you know, we did a beer called Hello, My Name is Vladimir at one point, which was uh, which was a, a comment on um, uh, Russia's approach to um, um, uh, the, the people attending are, are, are being are, are being part of the, the teams at the Sochi Olympics, I think, um, when when Putin was pretty unhappy about some kind of homosexual people being in, in various teams um, last year. Or actually, the year before, we uh, we um, produced a beer called Make Earth Great Again, which was a protest against Donald Trump's decision to bring the US out of the Paris Climate Accord. So we don't really overthink those things. I think that fundamentally, we just believe that it's important to use our platform for good and important to use our platform to talk about the things that we believe in um, and to put our head above the parapet. So I think if you get to a point where you're too worried about the conflicting view, then you won't do brave things. Um, so we will uh, we'll continue to take to look at those things one by one as they happen. Um, we certainly won't make a comment for the sake of it, uh, but if something's important to us, then we won't be afraid to to state our uh, to state our position. Yeah, which will resonate, you know, just resonates hugely with the consumer, um, you know, consumer environment. And I think it's great that there's a brand that's not afraid to say things. Um, one question here, which you don't need to answer, is can I come and work for you? I think that's a great question. <laughs> from, no from, one's from, ever asked me that before. Um, I, it's not a colleague as well, so it's a relief. It must be a client, um, but I'm going to, they'll remain nameless, so I don't know, put them to shame. Um, the next question I was going to ask was, um, here we go. As you as you rapidly grown over the last few years, maintain the culture as you mentioned is critical to success. How have you evolved your operating model to retain the culture while managing a much larger business? So this is also, I, I mean, I think you probably touched this to an extent, but maybe just a little bit more, and that'd be interesting. Yeah, and I, listen, I think that if you think about where we, you know, where we are versus ten years ago, so you know, some of the most um, well-invested and sophisticated craft brewing operations and breweries and plants on the planet um, um, a very well-developed um, logistics and supply chain infrastructure all very serious stuff and sometimes the stuff that you don't hear when we're talking about Brewdog um, and we have over the years built a team of some very exceptionally talented individuals who make this business tick day in day out 
Um, um, and so I think that it's been um, certainly a, a twofold thing. First of all, bringing great expertise in, um, into various areas of the business um, uh, and building a team of great subject matter experts who can teach us how to build a, brewer, uh, a beer business at the scale that we've become. Um, and second of all, and probably most importantly, making sure that that overarching, relentless, obsessive focus on ensuring that we live and breathe the things that got us here um, is, is is a big part of you know my time and the founders' time day in, day in, day out. So we constantly say that what we did yesterday is just not good enough for today. And it breeds a culture of relentless, continual improvement. Um, and it forces us to you know, think very carefully about the things that we get right, right or wrong. So the most important thing that I do day in, day out is foster that culture and spirit. Um, and that is far more important than sitting in a meeting room um, or, um, or whatever else my time might get dragged, uh, dragged into. So I try and force myself to spend as much time as close to our teams as possible supporting that agenda. Amazing. Um, good question here we've had in. Apart from someone who also wants to know whether you're opening Ipswich, they weren't that interested in Chelmsford, but that's uh, we won't digress. Um, it was um, interesting. So insurgents become the establishment, naming sort of Apple and Google. How are you going to prevent yourself from becoming the establishment? Well, well listen, I think that the, um, we, we probably view end goal success <laughs> as being um, larger than the established players. Um, um, and I think that, um, you know, Apple as an example has evolved and changed over the years. And um, um, however, I think some of those businesses with remarkable, remarkable scale have still achieved that in a very forward thinking and unconventional way. Um, if we got anywhere near that level of success, then I think that we probably wouldn't be kicking ourselves for becoming the establishment. We'd be probably pretty proud of ourselves for the scale. Um, but there's just nothing in the business and and the people who run this business that will allow us to do that in a way that is not brutal and is not in line with our culture and our spirit. Um, so that may reach a natural end in terms of scale. Um, and we don't get to decide that. The consumer gets to decide that. You know, people often talk about how many bars or how big or what's the scale or what's the, you know, is it a billion pounds of revenue or what? how big can you get? And we can't answer that. We just can't answer that. All we can do is put our heads down, believe in what we believe and keep going. And the consumer is going to tell us when we have reached a limit or a tipping point. And that's our firm belief. Um, so hopefully there's a bit of headroom still to go. Um, and, um, and we will just try and do that in a way that is in line with our beliefs. Yeah, I mean, you, you can hear that through your presentation, having spoken to you already before, you really get a feel for that about the business. So I can see that how that's um, that's going to play out. So, so it's yeah, it's uh, it's it, you know, it, it's enlightening for sure. Um, good question here. What's the Brewdog Christmas party like? <laughs> it was pretty poor last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like every like everyone else. And um, one of the, it, it's, I'll answer a slightly different question in, in that. When I showed the slide on equity for punks, that was that was at our annual general meeting. Um, so it's now the largest, most well attended AGM in the UK. I think we, uh, I think Lloyd's is second now. Um, and um, we didn't have one last year clearly, but the year before that, we were, were fifteen thousand people in an exhibition centre in Scotland. Um, and it's a bit, it's more like a festival um, or a concert than a than a than an AGM. And it's a really life affirming day. It's like it brings our community together and it reminds us why we all do this thing in the first place. So that's a very important day in the Brewdog calendar. Um, and um, uh, and the, Christmas, uh, the Christmas get together is always, uh, it, it, always pretty, pretty raucous, as you can imagine. Um, all I can remember from the last one is that I escaped a few hours earlier than everyone else because I couldn't really keep up. So. <laughs> Very wise. Yeah, go hard, go early, and then leave before it all goes yeah. wrong. Very wise. Indeed. Um, when recruiting people, do you have any quirky questions or processes you adopt a sort of brew dog style to make sure you're getting the right people? Well, quirky is a dangerous word, isn't it? It's like and and I and I think that we we um 
Uh, we certainly don't do that sort of stuff for the sake of it. But um, I have one question that I always ask. There's only one question that I've probably asked in every single interview as I've been building this team. Um, and that question is, what are you like when things go really badly wrong? And by asking that question, I think, first of all, you are pretty honestly getting over to the, the potential employee that they're going to work in an environment that's fast paced and is tough and where they need to have grit and resilience and tenacity and all of those great attributes. But also from the way the person answers that, I often get a really good feel of how they face into adversity. Um, and it's back to that whole type two fun thing in this in that uh, you know analogy about finding out who your best people are when things don't go according to plan. Um, the reason that I'm most so proud of the Brewdog team right now, and I think we've got the most capable team we've ever had, is that they truly have gone through the last 12 months and been forged in the fire of incredible adversity. Um, and they've been in the trenches together. So all of a sudden, you know, a team like that needs so little management because they're so tight. Um, um, and, and so I asked that question to try and make sure that I get under the skin of, 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 of how people respond to adversity. And I find that really useful. Yeah. Okay. That, that's a, yeah, that is a good question to ask. That's a good question to ask. Um, just a question, very topical, obviously, especially at the moment. How do you deal with well-being in the business? So, um, it's so, it's in, it's incredibly important to us to keep our teams as connected as they possibly can can be, and also to make sure that, especially as they're working so virtually and remotely, um, to ensure that there's enough opportunity and platform uh, for them to raise their hand and without any kind of judgment whatsoever, talk about the things that they're struggling with. Out with a load of different things that we have going on, we have a, a team app called Huddle, actually, that everyone has access to where we share recognition and rewards and, and updates. Um, we just had, um, last Friday, actually, we just had a, an award ceremony called the Brewdog Lockdown Hero Awards, where the team voted for the people in the various teams who had helped everyone through lockdown um, um, in, in a really considerable way. Um, and we have a quite well-developed mental health assistance program, um, which is very important to the business. Um, because we really believe that when you're throwing yourself into something that's this fast and this aggressive sometimes, then it's very easy for people to get lost and feel as though they can't put their hand up and ask for help. So we have to over index on that kind of stuff. I think the most important thing that we do is keep our line managers as close to their teams as they possibly can be. So um, uh, there is no performance, there's no formal performance review system in BrewDog, but there's one really important rule. And the rule is that at any point in time, any team member can ask their line manager for direct feedback. So how am I doing and how am I performing? And the line manager has to be 100% honest with them. Um, and uh, so people ask me that question. It took a while for us to embed that in the culture, but people ask me that question all the time. And I will stop and spend some time with them and give them very direct, supportive and honest feedback. And I think that's been one of the most important cultural things we've done to ensure that people can continue to grow and develop, uh, but also that we can kind of red flag when people need to put their foot in the ball and get a little bit of support for a while. Um, and um, we'll always do that with our team because they're they're family, right? So. Yeah, that's a great that's a great that's a that's a really interesting um, take on how to yeah provide that continual and positive feedback. Um, but also, I believe in that you you know it's not only a it's not only a management line manager led issue. It's also people asking for that feedback. It's a two way process, and if you foster that, I can see the advantages. Um, what keeps you up at night? Um, I'm I'm a, so. My early career was in hospitality, um, and a lot of that early career was in nightclubs. So I'm a complete night owl. Um, so un unfortunately, that I'm, you know, I'm, you read all these business stories about CEOs and leaders who get up at five in the morning and they they run a marathon and and write a book before they start doing any work. Right? Um, and I'm not that guy. Um, however, I'm far more likely to still be up at two two thirty in the morning 
you know, scratching my head, trying to solve a solve an issue. Um, the things that keep me up at night are not the things that you know maybe you would expect. So it's not the the you know the global expansion. It's not the various projects that we have going on because I have so much faith in the team. Um, I think what keeps me up at night is our ability to maintain a steadfast and resolute belief and focus on what's important to us. So quite often, I feel that my job is 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 saying no to the things that don't add value, um, ensuring that our team are focused on the things that really add value and where they can have positive impact. Um, so a lot of the time, um, I will struggle when I feel that we're involved in a project or a piece of activity that isn't contributing to the mission. And when that's the case, plenty of times we've been really far down the road with a project or an investment, and right at the last minute, we'll cut off our nose to spite our face and kill it because we've realized that we focused the team on the wrong thing. Um, uh, so when we go down the road of something like that, then that's that's when I tend to have a few sleepless nights. Fair, yeah, no, that's, uh, that makes sense. Um, oh, if you could go on holiday anywhere in the world tomorrow, <laughs> where would you go? So co ignoring COVID. <laughs> I just love to go on holiday. Yeah, I just love to go on holiday. I'm a big, big Asia fan, so I would love to. Uh, we have we some we have some businesses in Asia actually, and um, I love traveling around um, various various parts, and um, love love Tokyo. Um, and very very keen to get back there. It's just a phenomenal, friendly, forward thinking, innovative, exciting, and vibrant city. So, lots and lots of places. But top of my head, that would be that would be a, that would be a good one. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I don't want to get too personal, but I'll, I'll risk it. I mean, are you picking up a feeling? I pick it up from colleagues, clients, that people are really um, strung out. I had um, someone explain to me they say that their morale's not low, but their their emotional their their emotional capacity is now getting pretty strained. Um, I certainly feeling it. I think uh, I know lots of others are. Is that something you are feeling personally? Yeah, I mean, I I think that I've got a. A decent capacity to deal with whatever is thrown at the business and thrown at me. Um, um, but I'm also, because um, this is quite personal now, isn't it? I'm also quite impatient. Um, I have a very short attention span, um, and uh, and I and and it's really important to me to be um, as visible as as visible as possible in work life with our teams, um, but also to be exposed to as a diverse uh, a set of influences and communities as possible so having a year of being you know I, I kind of i'm here in glasgow actually and, and i have another house next to the brewery in aberdeen so um uh, uh, being being between those two places for the last year when normally a year for me is is probably 150 or so flights uh, has been challenging um and uh, you know i crave all of the stuff that everyone else craves um but I'm also an eternal optimist. Um, and I think you need to be in a job like this. And so I believe we'll come through the other side stronger. Um, and I believe we will we will really, really ensure that we uh, don't take for granted the things that we've missed out on over the last 12 months or so. And for us as a business, then hospitality is a great example of that. And with my positive hat on, I think one of the great things that's happened while our hospitality and pubs business has been closed is that people have realized that they have a really deep and meaningful connection with the pubs and restaurants and cafes and their high street that they love. Um, and I think people will remember that in the years to come as we try and rebuild some of these businesses. Thank you for that. I've just been directed some questions that were higher up because they're streaming in thick and fast. Good. Um, oh, okay. What an amazing story, David, what an amazing story. Much of what you have told us resonates incredibly strongly with the cooperative model, so strongly uh, purpose-driven and crowd-funded. How do you see the BrewDog values playing out in the economy and society that emerges from this period of crisis? That's a big question. That's a really good question. I think there are a couple of things that we hope happens. First of all, we think that businesses will more and more realize that in some form or other community is incredibly important to what we to what they do um, 
And we find that out by accident as per the equity for punk story. Um, uh, but we believe that businesses that are really rooted in a strong sense of purpose and community um, will have far more chance to thrive in the, in the, in the months and years ahead. Secondly, linked to my point on sustainability, um, I think that consumers now want to understand the inside of businesses, the nuts and bolts of how they think and, believe, and behave and what they believe and how they operate, um, and use that to decide how they spend their money. So that's hard work for businesses, right? So we should all remember that. It's like it's, it's, not, it's not quite as straightforward as make the product and put it on the shelf anymore. Consumers are more and more and more demanding. The benefit of you can get that right is that once in our, you know, our, our community and our investors are a great example of that. Once they believe in you, they will fight for you like crazy. They will be massively ambassadorial um, and they will buy your product till you know, the end of time because they believe in what you believe. Um, so there's great positives. There's huge reward for businesses that believe in community and purpose, but it's it's um it's higher stakes than the old days of of uh, of commerce for sure thank you very much i'm conscious i uh, yeah it, yeah it's it, it is it is fascinating i am conscious of time i know you said it had are you okay to carry on as we you know to, that, that we have had a lot of questions um and so i I'm, I'm i think we're kind of at the point but I'm just going to say to the audience, you're very welcome to continue to stay on. But if those have got other things to do, I'd just like to say thank you very much um, for joining us um, this evening and have a lovely evening and um, yeah, behave like a, you know, when you go to bed tonight, work out how you're going to behave like a shark on steroids. But thank you very much. So I'm going to assume that some people may be dropping off. I don't, I'm not entirely sure, but you're okay to carry on for a little bit longer? Yeah, I'm happy to do another five, ten minutes of questions, no problem. Um, I like this question. I'm ashamed to admit that I don't drink beer. Which of your beers do you recommend for a complete novice who usually drinks gin or wine? Yeah, it's great. And I think that when um, one of the things that we do in our in our bars that I'm really proud of is that the team are brilliant at taking people through the various stages of their beer journey. And so I, when someone walks into a brew dog location and I watch a customer speaking to them and saying, I don't really like beer, then their eyes tend to light up because it's an opportunity and a challenge all at the same time. Um, uh, so I would, uh, this is really, really very, very convenient because I would recommend this beer. Um, and this is Dead Pony Club, which is our session pale ale. So it's really, really very accessible. It's 3.8% ABV, so it's not too strong. Um, um, but it's really flavor packed. So it's a great introduction to the type of hop characteristic that you'll find as you go through the various stages of, of Brewdog beers. This beer is packed with lemongrass flavor, uh, lychee, passion fruit, lots and lots of tropical fruit characteristics, but it's super drinkable and super sessionable. So in, in most supermarkets around the UK, that's my sales pitch, um, but this would be, and this is still, you know, years and years on, it's still my go-to beer. The fridge has always got a few four packs of this in it um, and a great entry to world, uh, the world of Brewdog and a great entry to craft beer. No, uh, yeah, I can, I think that's a, uh, a, a good shout. It's just one of my favorites as well. I do really enjoy it. Um, do you get a lot of, um, do you get a lot of takeover or at purchase offers, people wanting to either invest or buy you out? Um, you know, we have, uh, we've, if you look at the history of the last five to seven years in craft beer, then there is a pattern of, um, and this happens in any industry and category as it grows, in any insurgent category. Uh, there's a pattern of larger, you know, the four or five larger beer businesses buying out a suite of craft beer businesses. So, you know, it would be, you know, folly for me to even pretend that we haven't had offers along the way. Um, it really doesn't ring true to what we built this thing for. Um, it doesn't ring true to our belief in community and it doesn't ring true to our belief that an independent business of scale, an independent beer business of scale is most likely to do all the things that we want to do, which is to really try and put the 
focus on taste and flavor and craftsmanship back into the beer industry. Um, so yeah, we've, we've had our door knocked several times um, and we've politely said thanks, but no thanks up until this day. And, and that, that will continue to be the answer. Thank you. Uh, there's a question in, um, just here as well, saying, what drove you into having such a strong sustainability stance in everything you do? Well, that's such a good question. So um, uh, uh, this might take up all the rest of our time, actually, but about a year and a half ago, um, uh, um, we are lucky enough to be mentored, James and I are lucky enough to be mentored by a phenomenal Scottish businessman and philanthropist, a guy called Sir Tom Hunter. So um, um, uh, he um, uh, he's an uh, inc incredibly successful businessman, probably Scot Scotland's most successful businessman over the years, and now focuses all of his time on philanthropy. Um, and he arranged an event for some business people in Edinburgh about a year and a half ago. And uh, amazingly, he got Sir David Attenborough to come and speak at the dinner. So. We found there. We got to take some of our team there as well. It was awesome. So there was like eight, eight of us at this dinner, and uh, we were fortunate enough to, to speak to, listen to Sir David Attenborough speak for an hour and a half, incredibly passionately about sustainability and the impending climate crisis. James and I were also lucky enough to meet him one to one for a chat beforehand, and he was just inspirational. So. We thought we were kind of doing our bit, you know, we really did because we were removing plastic from our supply chain. All of the things that, you know, we were we were using our spent grain from the brewery and turning it into feed that went to uh, feed livestock near the brewery. We were doing we were doing some stuff and we felt that that was enough. And we left that night with this kind of feeling of dread that we weren't even scratching the surface. Um, and it gave us a real sense of purpose and momentum to go and find out more about this topic. Um, and as a result of that, we realized that first of all, there was a duty in that we think, you know, as I said in my presentation, we think that how consumers spend their money will be as important as how they vote in years to come. And I guess we also realized that there was an opportunity because the more that we investigated this, we more that the more that we realized that there was this growing army of consumers who were making their purchase intent decisions based on the sustainability agenda of the organization. Um, so we, you know, and again, referring back to my presentation, we realized that the world's most successful beer business was one day going to be the world's most sustainable beer business. We don't think that the large scale behemoth businesses that are so set in stone um, and so established have the ability to repurpose their model and fit that bill. Um, and we realized that we were at a point in our journey where we were in a position where we could really do that. Um, and we have put it at the forefront of everything that we do. So if, if anyone's got a lost lager in front of them, then that beer is a really important part of our sustainability journey because one of the things that we want to do as well as investing heavily in um, uh, emissions reduction and uh, and also in things like the Brewdog Forest, one of the things we want to do is to create a program and a suite of products that help us use our platform to bring sustainability and the issue to life with consumers. So Lost Lager is made using surplus bread in the malt bill. So we take the heels of uh, sandwich loaves that are used to make sandwiches in the supermarkets and we collect all of that from the supplier and we grind it down and it goes into the beer making process as opposed to some of the malt so by making by doing that we're supporting and helping food waste uh, which is a critical part of the the climate issue that we face into our brewery is a hundred percent powered by three wind turbines that are a mile away from the brewery so that beer is produced only using wind energy and we have worked really hard with our beer development team uh, to make that beer with a third less water than a conventional beer is made so we're calling it a planet first lager um, it's our product to really take on the kind of macro beer guys at lager which is a huge category um, and we're doing it with firm focus on sustainability at its core and we think that makes that product really stand out. 
Amazing. And I, I think I think what I love about everything I hear about Brewdog and the business is a real lesson that you're not shy to accept that the sustainability piece, for example, and, and the drive has a has a commercial advantage as well. And there's nothing yeah. to worry about finding, you know, finding um you know that the mutual sort of benefit in those things i sometimes feel some brands are sort of a bit like well you know they're a bit embarrassed that they you know that helps them you know drive their business and grow and, and you see that i think you know you're, the transparency across your business uh you know rings true to that all the examples um you know we've heard um tonight i think i just think it's amazing um i just think the, the culture of your business the way you go about things the way you've been you disrupted the way you have this sort of presence of fun um and cheekiness but below it is this ferocious business that is hard driven in a tight way that is just going forward and tuning in and it seems probably the business i can know the most relevant to current culture and really picking up on things and that's not an accident that is because you are clearly listening and looking and you get great people on board and adapt to what you're doing so i think um I just think it's incredible. I just take my hat off to you and your team and everyone at Brewdog. Um, I think it's been you know, extraordinary, extraordinary finding out more about it. And I really, pre I, I really you. appreciate your time. So thank you very thank much. You very much. I'm, sh I'm sure the audience have thoroughly enjoyed themselves as well. If we were in an auditorium, I'm sure the roof would come off and they'd be clapping and cheering and everything else. Um, sure. But at this point, um, I am. Um, we are going to say goodbye to them. Thank you, everyone, for attending. As I said, I honestly think you should go and lie down at, in bed tonight and work out how you can be that shark on steroids. And if you can take some of the learnings from Brewdog into your own business, I no doubt you'll continue to thrive. So, look, thank you all very much, for, and I hope you enjoyed yourself. Thank you very much to David, and um, have a nice evening. See you later.